there's certain things that we want to do in order to just begin that process of building our own discipline. Because the discipline itself will deter a lot of demons from wanting to even tempt you. And the reason being is because as you go in virtue, the lower faculties, as I mentioned, become more sensitive. And so as time goes on, as we gain and we increase in virtue, the um, St. Thomas says this principle, he says the body adjusts itself to the operations of the soul. And basically that we all know this. We know that, for example, if you get up uh, some guy who's laying on a couch for you know, hours and hours and hours a day and then says, I want to run a marathon, he's not going to get very far. Where he, where, where's, and he sees 300 pounds, he's overweight, he's, he gets a block or two, and then it's time for the ambulance. Whereas if he takes his time and he starts building his way up to it and he gets to the point where, you know, he starts with just getting the block and then a mile and then five miles, etc., and he just keeps doing it, eventually the body begins to adjust it. This is, we call this getting in shape, right? This is just, we, this is part of the human experience. The thing is, this is even true even of virtue. So as you start growing in virtue, what happens is the body adjusts so that it, it can execute the actions that pertain to those virtues easily and well. That means that if a demon comes to tempt you, what's going to happen is, is you're going to be much more sensitive to this motion that's contrary to your virtue. Therefore, you're going to just not want to, um, they're just not going to want to tempt you, basically is what it boils down to. Okay. So, uh, that discipline is very key and it's very important. So we want to talk about uh, first a few things to always some basic principles to keep in mind. The first is, as I mentioned before, that God is in complete control of all aspects of the spiritual war. Every single aspect to it. So any involvement that any demon would have or any temptation he's going to have it can work to your benefit if you respond to God's grace. It's going to, it can be there for your purification. It can actually be there for your advance in virtue. I've also mentioned this, that the virtue that a lot of times people struggle with the most, that God allows them to be tempted in relationship to the most, is often the virtue that God wants the person to excel in. So there have been cases where I had where one woman um, was possessed by a demon of fear, and the virtue that God wanted her to master was humility. And so she started working on humility. And so this is a, a key thing to, um, that this, this humility would actually give the foundation so she had courage. But it was one of those things that as she began to work on it, things began to shift in, the, in relationship to the possession case. Okay, so God's in complete control of it. Um, that he's never going to give you, as St. Paul says, there is no temptation, there's no spiritual battle, part of the battle. That if you're in the state of grace and trying to lead a good Catholic life for which God is not also going to give you the um, proportionate grace in order to sustain the, the, the attack. Right? And so sometimes God is very similar to a parent, usually men, who will take like a four or five year old boy down to a boxing ring. Right? And he'll put the kid in the boxing ring and he'll put a set of gloves on him and he's, the gloves are so big, they're so heavy, he can hardly hold them up. Right? But he gives him some pointers. Okay, hold up, hold your, hold your arms up. You know, when he comes over, jab him. This. So he gives him some basic pointers, etc. And he puts him in the boxing ring with someone who's a little bigger than him. And the reason he's doing this is because of the fact that he, when, when his, uh, the, his son, who's a little smaller, gets hit around a little bit, he realizes, I can survive this. I can take it, you know. It might hurt a little bit, might sting, but I can do it, Right. And it gives a person a certain level of confidence. And confidence, so the next thing is, that's one of the things that is so key in the spiritual warfare is confidence. What is confidence? Confidence is trust that God is going to get you, uh, that's going to save you, protect you, and get you where you need to be. So we actually, uh, we, you know, uh, there's actually a line in scripture where we ask God for confidence. It's in the Psalms. We ask God for confidence so that we're not confounded. What does that mean? Well, confounded, confusion is defined as when two contraries exist in the mind at the same time. Well, what would be the confounding? That we know that God loves us, he protects us, he's a good father, but then some reason or another we don't seem to be being protected. But that's the whole point. If you have perfect confidence in God... It doesn't matter what happens, you know it falls within his will, and you know you can keep your focus. 
And that's the real issue. Two aspects to confidence. One is, is that you have to keep your focus on God. God has to be your focus. The way the demons will very often attack us, and it, you actually see this with oppression, part of the reason that God allows oppression is that as the, as the demons are attacking the person's externals, the person is forced into this situation where either you've got to start relying on our Lord and our Lady, or you're just going to get taken to the woodshed. There's no mean in spiritual warfare, and it's actually true in sp the spiritual life in general, there is no such thing as treading water. The only fish that don't st fi uh, that go upstream are the dead ones, basically. And so the point being is, is that you have to keep working against this and working and fighting against it. And even in the relationship to the spiritual warfare, you can't tread water. There's no comfort zone, unfortunately. But that doesn't mean there's not joy and peace and all those things pertained to the fruits of the, Holy, of the Holy Spirit, right? So, and this is something that God will give to you. And you can even have people who are, I've seen this, people who are possessed, people who are in the midst of some of the most horrific types of spiritual warfare, and yet the peace and the surrender there is because they have absolutely perfect confidence in God. The confidence also says something else. You know, if, if a child... If a parent says, uh, no, you've got to trust me, don't worry, I'll take care of you, and the child just looks at I don't trust you, the two things happen. First is that the parent is insulted, right? If God is omnipotent, I think he can take care of your little problems. The second component is, so you don't have to worry about his ability to do it. He's omniscient, so he knows what the truth is. So it's not like he's not getting it, right? He gets it, he knows what's going on. But it's also insulting to him that you would basically tell him you don't trust him. And that is where I think the demons are going to try and get their foot in the door with you. Whereas if you have perfect confidence in him, the demons also know that, they will Im that you'll immediately turn to him as soon as it's, uh, the, the battle starts. Because you know, we all know this, as human beings in relationship to the diabolic, we are absolutely powerless. There is nothing we can do on our own, independent of Jesus Christ, to be able to fight this battle. We are absolutely dependent on him. People when, sometimes will ask me, how many people have you liberated? I always tell them, none. Now, by that I mean this. There's been, you know, hundreds of people liberated in my presence, but it's Jesus Christ who liberates. It's not the exorcist, it's Jesus Christ. And this is something that's really key to understand that. And it's the same thing in your own spiritual battles, even within your own homes. If you try and just deal with this thing on a natural level, or if you just try and deal with it on your own, you're going to get mopped up because the demons are smarter, more intelligent, more powerful than you are. Whereas if you depend on Christ and have perfect confidence in him, then what will happen is, is that you'll get the grace to fight and you'll actually get the grace to be able to do the right thing and have the power. Christ will work through you, Christ will work through you in that process. There, once during a session, this gives you an idea of the power that you can actually wield in relationship to this. During one of the sessions, something came up about Our Lady, and I commanded the demon to tell me something in relationship to it, and he just stopped and he looked at me, and in description, this is his description of Our Lady. He said, her power is in her humility. Let's unpack that. Humility is the virtue in which you do not judge yourself greater than you are. That's what it is. It's different theologians put it in different faculties, but in the end, it's the thing that helps you to be in contact with reality about who and what you are, what your strengths are and what your vices are, and you don't judge yourself greater than you actually are. That's what it ultimately is. In the process of that, Our Lady saw that in relationship to God, she was as if practically nothing. And as a result of that, she didn't try and take control. Every individual who tries to control, whether it's his, her wife or in relationship with her husband, a husband in relationship with his wife, whether it's all these things uh, that, you know, we try and control other people, it's a sign that you think yourself over them. In relationship to our own spiritual life, in relationship to the spiritual battle, it's the same thing. 
if you are in control, the demons can manipulate you, and therefore they're in control. If you re- and also, if you are in control, it means that you honestly believe you have it within yourself to actually control the spiritual warfare, which is utterly absurd. It's a complete delusion. The only thing that you can do is humble yourself, and why? Because when we're, when we're proud, we take over the situation, and then God can't work through us because we're blocking it. Whereas if we're completely humble, then he can act through us in the most perfect of fashions and execute what needs to be done because he's the one acting through us rather than us trying to be in control and moving the thing around through our pride. This is why Our Lady was the most absolutely perfect instrument in relationship to God uh, uh, in regard to the spiritual warfare. This is why she's so powerful. And this brings up one of the next things. You have to start working on virtue. The more virtuous you are, the less the demons are going to want to attack you. And when they do attack you, you have a, the virtue is itself. Virtue comes from the Latin word vir, which means strength. And so it literally gives you the strength to engage in the battle. But that means humility has to be the foundation of all of it. Okay. The virtues, if there is any defect that you have. Now, defect is just another name for vice in the sense that there's something in you that is not quite ordered and it has an inclination to something in a disordered fashion. Demons will use that. One of the things as an exorcist you find out in the first two years, I always tell the exorcist, when you, when you start doing solemn sessions, the worst two years are the first two years. Because, A, the demons are probing and prodding every single nook and cranny of your spiritual life. And by the way, they've been watching you all your life, so they know right where to press the button. And so you, it's literally sink or swim. You have to start working on your defects and get rid of your defects because if you don't, you're just going to get taken to the woodshed and they're just going to use it against you. And they'll, they can, I've seen this happen with actually priests. It causes a tremendous amount of damage. Um, and so especially when you get a priest, for example, who's overconfident in his judgment in relationship to spiritual matters, what will happen is a lot of times is the demons will use that and then it drives, they, they, they can drive people away from the, from the exorcist. So you have to look at, you have to take an honest assessment of what your virtues and vices are and where you need to shore them up. This pertains not just to you, it pertains even to your children, to your spouse. In fact, as one priest once said, he was sitting in the confessional and the, uh, <clears throat> a woman came in and for five minutes was telling her, the priest all her husband's sins. And so he asks her, is he in the church? And she said, yes. And he said, well, just push, her, push him in. I'll give him absolution. All right. <laughs> By the way, men can be just as bad. All right. The point being is, is that uh, a lot of times how your spouse reacts or what your spouse actually thinks your problems are, sometimes they're real and sometimes they're not. But you should be able to take a, an honest assessment about this. One of the most effective things in discovering what your virtues and vices are and where the demons can have possibly have a foothold in your spiritual life is asking Our Lady of Sorrows, specifically under that title, to reveal to you what, are, what is the predominant vice or virtue that your son wants me to work on. And I guarantee you, well, you can also ask your guardian angel because he's been dealing with you for a long time. Now, you have to be prepared because you may get flooded at least initially, and you're going to like, ooh, this is pretty ugly, okay. But the good news is, is, and this is the good thing, anytime you find out a defect, then you can start working on that and start working on those virtues because then that becomes the way in which you're going to combat the diabolic. I mentioned during the homily that there's two things that you have to get the discipline and the training. Well, the discipline is consummate with it in relationship to doing the... um, uh, building the virtues and the vices, but then you also need knowledge. And there's two kinds of knowledge. One, you need a general knowledge of how spiritual warfare works, and that's the point of this weekend. But then you also need knowledge of the particulars about wh- what the demons are doing in your life, whether they're doing anything at all, and if they are, then what are they doing? And a lot of times we are completely blind to it. Demons are extraordinary tacticians. We have to remember all the knowledge of all the essences of anything that was ever going to be created 
was infused in their mind at the time of their creation. This is why they can look at a tree and they can instantaneously exhaust everything there is possibly to know about a tree instantaneously. This means that when they look at the structure and the nature of warfare, they instantaneously know every single possible strategy that can ever be used in any circumstance. That's how knowledgeable they are. Okay, so what does this mean? They're master tacticians. And one of their, they, but, but they're very consistent though too. So one of the things that they'll very often do is they'll, they'll obfuscate. What they'll do is they'll create this kerfluffle over in one part of your spiritual life. So you're spending an enormous amount of time and energy and you notice you're not getting anywhere with the thing. That tells you that it's a diversion. They're dropping bombs over there and you're running over here and dealing with it when they're really over here. I'll give you an example. One of the most common difficulties I've seen among men is a struggle with chastity. Even if they're leading good Catholic lives or they're going to confession on a regular basis, they're going to mass on a regular basis, they're doing all sorts of devotions in order to try and overcome this thing and they're just not making any headway. And because, and they're, and they keep, so they'll go for a while but they keep falling into sins against chastity. All you have to do is ask them a question and you will get 95% of the men to say yes. Do you have a problem with fear, depression, or despair? And 95% of the time, they will name one of those three. 80% of the time, it's fear. Because Beelzebub, who is the demon of impurity, is in his nature a demon of fear. And that's what he drives. And so what happens is people spend all this time and energy trying to deal with the chastity when they've got to get to where they're at. Which is what? Where the uh, deal with, address the fear. So I'll give you an example. One time this guy comes to me and he had done everything under the planet to try and remain chaste. And he was just having a difficulty. So I just said, do you have a problem with fear? And he said, yes, I've always had a problem with fear. So what I did is I said, okay, I want you to start working on confidence in God. Sound familiar? That confidence. That's what the demons are continually chiseling away. I want you to really work on confidence, hope, and trust in God. And then I'm going to do this minor exorcism over you once a week. I did it over him once against, and I severed any connection that he had to any demon of fear. He went six months without an impure thought. That gives you an idea of how tactical they actually are. So what do you have to do? You have to ask Our Lady of Sorrows, reveal to me what is the nature of the demon that's afflicting me or that's afflicting my family because there's generational spirits that get passed from generation to generation. What's the nature of this thing? Because once you know what it is, then, okay, if it's fear, then you work on the opposite virtue, which is hope, courage, uh, confidence, trust in God. Those are the things that you actually work on. Whereas if it's something like anger, See, most people think that anger, sometimes it's, they just have to work on clemency, which is where you don't uh, mete out a punishment so severely on people. But the real problem with most people who suffer from anger is unwillingness to suffer because that's the real demon that's afflicting them. The definition of anger is a, a, a perception of injury with a desire for vindication. That's the definition of anger. A person feels injured, and so St. Thomas says they want to club the person over the head to stop them from hurting them, because, because why? They're feeling it. So I tell people, well, there's either one or two reasons that you, you're, you're, you've got a real anger issue. One is you're just evil because you like beating people over the head, which is not too many. But the other side is you don't suffer well. If you learn to suffer well, St. Thomas says, then anger just terminates in sorrow. Rather, and so the person just sorrows at being hurt rather than wanting to club the other person over the head. But what this tells you is, is that you really need to know the, the complexion of the spiritual battle in your own foxhole, right? Which brings up another thing. Don't go fighting other people's battles. Get, get, straighten out your own first. Then once you've secured your territory, then you can start helping other people. But this is an important point, and this is why it's really important to make sure that you're doing everything, asking our later stars to reveal to me what is it that we needs to be addressed, because then you can start having masses said for that. You can start doing prayers for in relationship to it. You can start doing binding prayers against any demons that are doing that. You can start working on the virtue, and then you're actually combating him. Okay. So that means that in, in so our Lord said, 
that in relation, so you need to have the knowledge. But our Lord also said that this particular demon cannot be driven except by, out by, except by uh, prayer and fasting. So let's talk about prayer first, then we'll talk about fasting second. In relationship to prayer, as I mentioned, asking Our Lady of Sorrow, show me the complexion of this thing, or reveal to me what I need to work on to shore these things up. And by the way, it works fantastic for parents of teenagers. Reveal to me, Our Lady, anything I need to know about what my son or daughter is doing. It's uncanny, the stuff you're going to find out. Okay, all the teenagers are like, this isn't good. Okay. <laughs> the point being is, is that it's, it's really important because a lot of times what's, some things are going on within the home that the parents are completely unknowledgeable about and they can get those things under control. But in relationship to the prayer, there's a few prayers that you're going to want to make sure that you're doing. We've already talked about some of the prayers that actually work in relationship to oppression, that is consecrating your exterior goods to Our Lady, doing the prayer against oppression, doing the uh, protocol, simply increasing your prayer life itself will help. But in relationship to, and we also mentioned in relationship to uh, uh, obsession, that one of the principal ways to deal with that is through daily meditation. You know, and the church's prior discipline there was not a single virtue that Catholics did not develop. This is before they made all the changes before Vatican II. Before the changes of Vatican II, if you simply were obedient to the laws of the church, there was not a single virtue which you would not have developed. That's not true anymore. When they slackened the, the, uh, the requirements, Two, that is, the disciplinary requirements in the church, two things happened. The first is, St. Thomas says, that, God, that the natural law commands all the virtue, that by the natural law we know we're, that we all have a natural desire to be perfect, and that's consummate with virtue. And so this natural desire, this natural inclination, means that, we have, that it commands all the virtues. Well, one of the virtues is fasting. Fasting two times a year ain't cutting it. Because it's not a virtue if you're only doing it twice a year. It's only a virtue if you're doing it on a consistent basis, which they used to do in the past. Okay. But the other part of it was, too, is, is that, and this is one of the reasons why the, um, a lot of uh, the priests themselves are being attracted to the traditional Latin Mass, which, by the way, I'm not trying to detract against the new Mass. I'm just saying, in the traditional Latin Mass, one of the things that was developed was meditation, because the lay people during a large part of the Mass were actually being quiet and meditating. And now, a lot of times, it's just, there's chatter, constant chatter. But the point I'm drawing out is that most people, most Catholics actually develop the life of meditation if they were going to Mass with any kind of regularity. So meditation is one of the principal means of keeping diabolic obsession and temptation at bay. As I mentioned before, St. Thomas says that you cannot root out venial sin in your life or any defect or get rid of your defects without meditation. That means meditation is, is like an armor. It's one of the principal ways to engage in the spiritual warfare. So if you're meditating 15 minutes a day, you're going to find a tremendous shift interiorly in the spiritual battle. So doing daily meditation. Padre Pio used to say that the, the rosary was the weapon. It's so powerful because people, in fact, they used to say back in the day that anybody who says the rosary devoutly and consistently every single day for a year and is committing mortal sin is either going to give up the rosary or give up the mortal sin. I think that's generally true. And so this is something that can help a tremendous amount is the rosary, praying the rosary for protection. Uh, saying the Sorrowful Mother Rosary, I just kind of recommend that because we do it as a society because one of the... Um, one of the promises that Our Lady gave in relationship to those who have devotion to her under the title of Sorrowful Mother was that she would protect them and their family from diabolic incursion. There are the, there's a book, which I'm sure some of you have, it's just called Deliverance Prayers for the Laity. In there, there's a whole host of things that you can actually pray in order to address the specific things. Remember that precision is everything in spiritual warfare. Just as we got done talking about how a person might be struggling with impurity, but the real problem is, is fear. And once they dealt with the fear, then boom, the chastity issues just evaporate. What that tells you is precision is everything in the spiritual warfare. 
And so one of the, that's why you ask our Lady of Stars the, the precision, and that's why there's different prayers for different things in order to be able to hone in on the specific thing. And once you find out what it is that's either the generational spirit in your family, that's the one that's been passed from generation to generation, I virtually know of no family that doesn't have them. That's why I always tell people, be careful who you're married because you don't know what spiritual baggage they're bringing on the airplane with you. All right. But the second point is, is that you also, uh, the, the knowing what your difficulties are, then you can start saying the prayers to precisely direct those and get the demons under, uh, bind them, cast them out, renounce them, and do a number of different things in relationship to that so that your prayers are very precise. I mentioned this before, in exorcism, what you'll find is, is that you're, you're exercising until the cows come home, and it's not until the demon just says, she has to do this one prayer. She does the prayer, boom, he's out. And so that's how precise this actually is. And so asking Our Lady of Sorrows, but then once you get that, start saying those prayers that are very precise in relationship to that. Also, praying the prayers of the Auxilium Christianorum, as I mentioned, because there's literally hundreds of thousands of people saying those prayers, and so you're plugging into a great deal of protection for you and for your family. Okay. Prayer. Then fasting. Fasting is just a general category, actually, for mortification. But mortification, what do we really mean? Well, remember when I was talking about the fact that our emotions are kind of like out of control because of original sin and our own actual sins? Well, the way you get these appetites under control, the way you get your emotions under control is through virtue. That's how you do it. If, for example, anger is the, it's the inversion of the virtues of clemency and meekness. You just work on meekness and it'll overcome and eventually your, these antecedent emotions begin to get to the point where you never have an antecedent emotion, ex but you only have consequent emotion. That's what perfection looks like. If you have any emotion in your life that you have a hard time controlling or regulating, that is a sign that there's a vice in that specific area of your life. And the demons know that, and they will make use of it, and they'll keep pressing those buttons, and they'll be putting all these perceptions on it. This is why you have to start doing, building all these virtues. Well, there's two virtues that, you're gonna, that most people never develop, and that's fasting on a consistent basis. As Rush Limbaugh once said, only in the United States are poor people obese. Right? This is true to some degree. Now, part of it is because they can't eat well because they're not eating good food. But part of it is, is that, you know, the Americans, I mean, you just, the minute, you, as I mentioned, the minute you tell people, you know, maybe you should fast, it's just like all of a sudden the, paw, the, the wrist goes up to the head and they're just like, oh, I can't do, Father, that's just too much. Really? Okay. So, uh, but the point being is, is that, and it's one of those things where the demons will sit there, see, it's too hard, you can't do this, you can't do this, you're, you're going to die if you don't go without that meal. You know, and then you go like, <laughs> you start fasting where you get to the point where you're on one meal a day for six days a week, and people are like, how do you do that? Well, the body adjusts itself to the operations of the soul. As you begin to start to gain the virtue, two things happen. The first is the body adjusts to it, so it's actually not that bad. In fact, if you feast too much, you feel bloated and it's painful. But the other thing is, too, is, is that as Aristotle said, and then from that point on in the entire moral tradition of the church, it was picked up, that when we have a virtue and we act according to the virtue, there's a delight in executing the action that pertains to that virtue. That's true even of fasting. Once you get to the point where you're fasting well, there's a delight in the actual fasting. It's also true about mortification and suffering. Have you ever wondered why you'll go to, you'll visit these old nuns, you know, they're like 90 some years old and they've taken vows and they've been in vows for like 72 years and you know and there's this kind of glow about them in the radiance and there's this joy that they actually have even though their level of suffering is far beyond what most people could even physically endure and the reason that is is because of the fact that they have gotten to the point where they suffer well they embrace the suffering they embrace their cross on such a consistent basis that they have become so virtuous in that regard that in the very act of embracing the cross they have joy that's what that is and that it, that's when demons see that they're one of the last people they want to attack but that also is a sign that once you get your body under subjection as saint paul says the demons don't want to attack you and they're going to avoid you like the plague. Although sometimes, as I mentioned, God says, doesn't matter. You got to go. They're conscripted. They're drafted. You got to go tempt him. 
and then they don't like it because they get beat around. Okay, but if you, if you gain those virtues and that mortification, then that will have a tremendous impact. Another thing it has to do, so this is one of the reasons why mortification, if there's any area in your spiritual life or any area in your day-to-day -day life where you're a little soft, you need to work on it because then that's, that's going to really give you the power to fight the spiritual warfare well. And it, it removes from the demons that area of your life where they can actually press the buttons. In fact, you know, as I mentioned before, there's that, that thing LBDB, Little Demon Big Drama. That's what it, you get with people who have a particular softness or an attachment or a vice in a particular area. The demon just has to press that little attachment, give you a little subtle fear about, ooh, you might lose, the, the, you know, you might lose your daily routine of looking on the Internet and reading the news, you know, and all of a sudden you're angry at your children because they're interrupting you. Right? That's what the demons do. They know how to get us to be fearful of those things that pertain to our attachments. What's an attachment? It's an inclination of one of our faculties to something in a disordered fashion. And most people have some level of attachment to something that's disordered. St. Thomas and then John of the Cross and then the entire spiritual tradition after them talk about how you have to get to the point where you have absolutely no attachment to any, any created thing whatsoever. Because it's only at that point, St. John of the Cross says, that you've removed everything from your heart, which is very limited in its size, and then God can take up the whole room in your heart. If there is anything you have an attachment to in the created order, then you can't love God with your whole heart because it's taking up that amount of that space in your heart. So what do you substitute with? Well, you remove all your attachments, even to your family, to your husband, to your wife, and all those types of things. You remove all that, and what replaces it is the Catholic understanding of charity. Charity is where you love your neighbor for God's sake. When you start loving your wife for God's sake, what happens is your love becomes, so St. Paul lames it, becomes more consistent, it's not puffed up, it's willing to suffer and endure things in relationship to him, the life of, of affection becomes more consistent, the, it's much more balanced, it's much more authentic, even in the emotional expressions, all of it. But if, it's, if there's any attachment, so you're not going to have that. But the demons are looking for your attachments, and those are the things that they're going to start driving and picking away at, and so you have to be completely detached from it. And you can ask somebody, I say, well, how do I know what I'm attached to? Very simple. Imagine yourself losing the thing completely, or it's being taken away from you, and see how much you uh, react, and that tells you. And that tells you, where you're, that tells you where in your fortress, in relationship to the spiritual battle, where the weak parts are. The demons are going to probe and look and see those, and they usually pretty know much, pretty much what they are. Okay. Devotions. There are certain devotions that are extraordinarily helpful in relationship to spiritual warfare. Obviously, devotion to Our Lady is extremely powerful. In fact, the more devotion you actually have, one of the devotions I highly recommend is doing the total consecration according to the mind of St. Louis Marie de Montfort. Because the people that are consecrated to Our Lady, as a general rule, find that the spiritual warfare is easier to sustain and that they can actually endure it and actually conquer the demons much more rapidly and more quickly. They also are afforded a lot more protection because you belong to her now. So having a very strong devotion to Our Lady. The other thing is devotion to St. Michael. Uh, you know, St. Michael really frosts most of the other demons, not all of them, but most of them. And the reason it is is because, according to the, the uh, common opinion, because people ask, there's nine choirs of angels. The top choir is the seraphim, then cherubim, then thrones, dominations, principalities, powers, it goes down, okay. The point being is, is that um, the question arose historically whether Satan was actually part of the cherubim or whether he's actually part of the seraphim. And St. Thomas says that he's actually part of the cherubim because of the fact that Lucifer means light bearer, and so he's primarily designed, he was primarily to enlighten people, but also because of the fact that um, the seraphim had such a powerful charity and love of God that they never would have fallen. However, which he does not share, even though I think there's something to his argument, and I tend to find I'm in agreement with almost everything that St. Thomas wrote except for a couple of things here and there. 
This is one area, and I'm not so sure about it. And the reason being is, is be, for two reasons. One is that the majority of theologians don't agree with him. They think he was actually the highest of all the angels that were created. The second component is because when you deal with him in session, <clears throat> the way he talks and the way the, all the other demons talk is that he was at the top of the heap. And it's be precisely because he was at the top of the heap, which is one of the reasons why he was so angry when it was revealed to him that Our Lady would outstrip him. Let's just put that in perspective. Our Lady's level of sanctifying grace exceeds the totality of all other creatures combined. This, and we actually know why, but he said when he saw her, he knew he would always be second best. This is, she is, in fact, if God had to make a choice between Our Lady and the totality of the rest of creation, he would take her. His love for her is fundamentally different than it is from anybody else. This is why he lets her do all this stuff and lets her actually drive the demons out. And actually, this is one of the reasons why the, uh, the demons actually fear her because, like I said, she shows up, it's over. But, okay, so he's at the top of this heap, but it really boils down to the one particular thing. And this is one of the key things in the spiritual life, in the spiritual battle. When... The angels fell. As I mentioned, there was this one thing that they had in their mind, and they thought, you know, I, I would really like to have that. And if they gave up on it, that giving that, offering that thing to God, giving it to him, so there's the offertory part. Dying to themselves, there's the slaying of the victim, which is what we have to do too. And then uh, they made sure it was complete, that they were totally chose to do the will of God. So they performed the three acts of sacrifice, offertory, slaying of the victim, and consuming. And so what happened is, is that the demons didn't do that. They did not sacrifice this thing they wanted. They just chose to hold on to it. That means that they did not perform the act of sacrifice. Every demon will admit that he failed in, or, in the order of the virtue of religion. There's the virtue of justice. That's by which you render people their due. Underneath that is the virtue of justice to God, which is the virtue of religion, where you render God his due. See, most people have this idea that, hey, I'm a pretty decent Catholic. Are you praying every day? No, sorry, St. Uh, Augustine said, if you don't pray, you're not going to be saved. The minimum requirement historically that they said that lay people had to pray was at least 15 minutes a day. Otherwise, if you, did it, if you went perpetually without doing it, it could become grave matter. Okay. But they failed, the demons failed to perform uh, underneath the virtue of religion is four acts. And one of those, one of them is prayer, obviously, but one of them is sacrifice. St. Thomas does these things once in a while. When you read them, you're just like, you know, how does he get away with this? You know, he'll say these lines, or other saints too will say these lines, and you're just like, how, how, how do they do that? So St. Thomas, may, it's, it's, in, it's in the Summa, in the virtue of religion, and St. Thomas, in response to one of his uh, questions, makes this, he says this one line that summarizes the entire spiritual life. He says, what God ultimately wants from every intelligent creature, that's angels and humans, the one thing that God wants from them is the sacrifice of their will to his. That's what the demons, every single one of them will admit they failed in that fundamental act in relationship to God. The same is true of us. Every time you sin, you're not sacrificing. You're not sacrificing your own will. Every time you don't do the good that God is prompting you through the sanctifying grace, you're not sacrificing. Our Lady once said at one of her apparitions, sacrifice everything. Sacrifice everything. That's what she did. So the point is, is that it's, the, it's by becoming very sacrificial. You know, people wonder um, why we have such a problem with some of the clergy and the bishops in the, in the, in the church. And I'll, I'll be frank with you. I'll tell you guys what I think it is. It's effeminacy. They're not men. Real men wouldn't be putting up with this garbage. 
that we'd be straightening things out and doing right by the people according to the divine pause of law, what God has decreed and the church has always taught. We wouldn't have all this mamby-pamby business about bishops in Germany talking about, well, maybe, you know, two homosexuals can have be in a civil union. We wouldn't have that nonsense. But the essence of a man is sacrifice. He sacrifices his comfort. He sacrifices his self-love, he sacrifices every aspect of his being for his wife. And if he does that, she will submit. And then, what does that mean? It means that she will sacrifice for him. But if he doesn't do it, he's got to be the head of the household. If he doesn't do it, she won't. And this is why, the, the re- this is why we're having such a difficult time. The priests, by and large, not all of them, but by and large are not sacrificial they don't go their extra distance for the, for, the, for the lay people. They don't go to bed tired for the sake of the lay people. They spend most of their time in committees, it seems. They don't do, you know, someone calls up, well, I don't know. There's no sense of, I'm going to die for this person. I'm going to put this aside for the sake of this individual's self uh, well-being. How do we know that? Every, you go to these parishes. I went to the, there's this one parish in this one city. I'm not going to name what it is. They have 4,000 families. 4,000 families and 45 minutes of confession on Saturday. How is that even possible? The, the, the parish I was in when I was the pastor in, in Idaho, I was hearing 135 confessions a weekend. And these people, you know, they, they have 4,000 people. I mean, they had one confessional. And, that, with that, and then the priest will say, oh, well, if you want to go to confession, make an appointment. Quit being lazy, Right? But this brings up a very important topic. You've got to pray for the bishops and for their priests so that they become more sacrificial. It's not until they become more sacrificial that we're going to see this, these things get straightened out. But then, then that brings up one other issue, and that has to do with right order within your family. One of the biggest segues of demons into families is disorder in the authority structure within the family. Now, what I'm about to tell you Don't kill the messenger. I'm just the guy telling you what God has said in Scripture. It's God. He's the one that set it up. If you don't like it, don't take it up with me. Take it up with him. All right. God said, well, first of all, when God created Adam and Eve, he created Adam, and then he told Adam, don't eat from the fruit of the tree. Then he created Eve, and he brought Eve to Adam. Now, the word in Latin, which, by the way, people will say, well, in the original Greek, we don't have the original Greek. We've got 8th century or 6th century copies. Well, in the original Hebrew, we don't have that either. What we have, what we, the only thing that we can guarantee is the Latin Vulgate and its lineage. That's why the Council of Trent said this is the only scriptures that we can guarantee is inerrant. Okay, all that being said, that's one of my platform but the point being is, is that in the Latin, the word for he led her to Adam is conducere. It's the same word for to hire. Interesting choice of words. This is why the church has always said, and it even says it, let us make him a helper. What does that mean concretely, those two things put together? It means this, that the responsibility for absolutely Everything in the home is the husband's and the father's. He's the one that is responsible for all of it. His wife, and that I tell guys, oh, I don't change diapers. Really? That's your job. Your job is to change the diapers, feed the kids, and do that, and do the dishes, and do all this. The good news is God, God created a helper who's not your slave. She's there to help you do your job. That's what this is about. Okay, so what does this mean concretely? When Eve ate the fruit, she stepped out from underneath that authority structure. St. Thomas says that women were originally created in a state of subordination. They were created underneath. um, Eve was created underneath Adam according to the natural law. But what he said, but the hallmark of that state was that Adam loved her, took care of her, protected her, was solicitous of her. That was the hallmark of it. When Eve ate the fruit, she stepped out from underneath Adam's authority because remember, Adam was, the don't eat from the fruit of the tree was communicated to Adam and then Adam communicated it to Eve. 
So when, Eve's, when Eve ate the fruit, she actually stepped out from underneath the authority structure of Adam seeking self-sufficiency. I'm going to mention this here in a minute. Self-sufficiency and independence from Adam. Those are the two hallmarks of the feminist movement. Now, don't get me wrong. Men have been cads throughout history and not treated their wives properly. I'm not denying that. But that, that the feminist movement, which actually started, if you want to read the actual blueprint for the feminist movement, read the interview by Clara Zenkin of Vladimir Lenin. He laid the whole thing out. What you're seeing today is absolutely identical to what he said in relationship to the feminist movement. Okay, but the, we're playing on the, this, 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 this Eve's desire for independence and self-sufficiency, independent of Adam. Okay, but when she ate the fruit, she stepped out from underneath the twofold form of authority. She stepped out from underneath the authority of God, so she became subject to diabolic influence, but she also stepped out from underneath the authority structure in relationship to her husband. The two principal effects of authority is to provide and to protect. The husband's authority is not for him. Let me say that again. The husband's authority is not for him. It's for the benefit and for the sake of his wife and his children. If he ever, ever exercises it contrary to the benefit of his wife or his children, he will stand before God and account for every time he does that. Just to be clear, because all authority comes from God, and it's abusive of God if you're doing if you're misusing that authority. So, but that means that the wife would be protected and provided for if she remains underneath. This is not true just on a material level. This is actually true on a spiritual level. That if she stays underneath her husband, she will be she will not be as subject to diabolic influence. I cannot tell you how many cases we have of possession in a family, and there is so much disorder within the family. The kids are practically telling the parents what to do, the wife is basically in control of the husband, and then uh, you've got all these just disorders. Which, by the way, the desire to control your husband was a punishment. In Hebrew, it says, and it says this also in the Latin, he says to Eve after she's eaten the fruit, because you have done this, um, you will bear children in pain, and pain, which is true, and that's what the women did. And then he said, and your desire shall be for your husband. That meant that as a punishment, women are now have two parts to what they call the curse of Eve. The first is it's, harder for, it's hard for women to be away from their husband. It's harder for guys to be gone for long, for, them, for their husbands to be gone for long periods of time as a general rule. But the second thing is the desire for, in Hebrew means the desire to control. And this is one of the most, and the demons constantly work out. And how, why? What is the foundation for that desire to control? Well, you try and control somebody for one of two reasons. One, by the way, the reason I'm going into this is because this is the area where all of the disorders and all the spiritual warfare comes to a head within a family. The desire to control is based because either you want something from somebody or you're afraid they're going to hurt you or they're not going to do right by you or what have you, which is another way of saying hurt you. And that's what most women do. So what did, what did St. Paul say? St. Paul says he gives, the, he gives the complete opposite to it. He said, husband, love your wives. Why? Because if you love your wives, the definition of love is willing the good of another. You're going to do right by her and you're going to do good to her. Right, and you're going to show the proper forms of affection, and such. You're going to be solicitous for her. You're going to do what Adam did originally. Okay, if you don't show your wife love on a regular basis, if you don't love her in a rightly ordered way, she will de facto become more controlling. It's the nature of the beast, because why? Her desire is for you, and you're not giving her this that fulfillment, and so she's going to start manipulating, and controlling you, get out of you what you want. You see this all the time. On the other hand, so, so basically, if the husband doesn't love his wife, she's just going to become more controlling. And the demons are going to drive that, right? Then on the other side, the demons are going to drive her desire to control, and he's going to desire, to, she's just going to become more and more controlling. What happens when a woman becomes more controlling? 
There's a fantastic scripture. It's in Proverbs, and it's Proverbs 31. It's called the Mulierum Fortis track, a strong woman who will find one. And then it gives a listing of all the attributes of a good woman, a good wife, right? And in there, it's very interesting. One of the lines is, when he has a good wife, it says, he has no need of spoils. You hear of a man cave? The reason the guy's going there is because he's trying to get away from his wife, right? That's the spoils. Or he gets involved in building cars or doing this or doing that, rather than if, he, if, the, wife is, if the wife submits in a rightly ordered way, not in a subservient way and not like a slave, but submits to his proper authority as, because the authority comes from God. So I always tell women, look, your husband is probably an absolute idiot. It doesn't matter because the authority comes from God and you're obeying God and not him. Okay. So that being said, you keep that in mind that if you're, if you're by obeying your husband, then you're actually obeying God. And when you do that, the right order sets in within the family. If the wife tries to control her husband, de facto, he will grow cold towards you. And that's how the demons drive it. He gets, they, they, if, if the wife starts to become controlling or has a hard time, and how does she get him to control? Because he, in, the demons will often tell the husband, or the husband will do something really stupid, and then it hurts the wife, and so she becomes more controlling, and there's this back and forth and back and forth. And the solution to it is, is he's just got to love her and, and express that, and then if she submits, then this right order takes place, and then there's peace within the home. The definition of peace is the tranquility of order, St. Augustine defined. If you have that, then what will happen is that peace will then descend to the children. Women will come to me and say, none of my children obey me. They're just completely out of control. I always ask them one question. Uh, do, you, or do you submit to your husband? Never. On the other hand, if you see these women who are rightly ordered, they're virtuous women, and they submit to the husband, first of all, the guy loves her to death, and then the second of all, the kids are very orderly as a general rule. The, the, the fallen Adam and Eve, the problem is with husbands is, is what hurts the wife is two things. It's, a, it's called the curse of Adam. It's irresponsibility. So Adam was irresponsible, and so God punishes him. Now men have to suffer with being irresponsible. And then the second part is, is that he has to work in thorns and suffering, which means men have a tendency towards effeminacy and laziness and not doing what they're supposed to do. And that's what drives women out of their minds, right? These two respective curses just keep aggravating each other, but that's why St. Paul says, husbands, love your wives, women, submit to your children. I tell people that um, St. Thomas says that women were created in, women are in three states. The first state, she was created in a state of subordination, but as I mentioned with Adam and Eve, but in that state, the hallmark was that Adam was loved, loved her and was solicitous of her. But after the fall, women entered into a state of subjection, which basically meant that, uh, that Adam stopped treating her well, stopped loving her, didn't do right by her, etc. And then he says, uh, in heaven, women are neither in a state of subordination nor subjection because some women rule in heaven. That's obviously true with the saints. It's obviously true with Our Lady. She's the queen of heaven and earth, right? So I tell women, this is the moral of the story. Don't go for the short-term payout by trying to control your husband in this life. Rather... Conquer this curse of Eve by submitting to him in a rightly ordered way. If you do that, there is no virtue you can't obtain. If you don't, there is no virtue you will ultimately obtain. But if you submit to him and become holier than him, then you can boss him around for all eternity. All right. But in order to do that, you have to submit to him in a rightly ordered fashion. But it's this authority structure that if you step outside of it, that's why people are getting shellacked. The children, we know this in relationship to children. We know that this is a key point in spiritual warfare because of why. If you tell a three-year-old child, you can play here in the, in the sandbox, but do not go out in the street. 
if he li- doesn't listen to you and he runs out in the street, he steps out from under your authority and then he gets run over. It's the same thing in the spiritual life. If you step, this authority structure was designed to provide and protect. If you stay underneath it or within it, you will be safe and you will, you will be provided for by God and you'll be protected. This is not true just on a material level. This is true on a spiritual level. One of the biggest failings of men who are husbands is a failure to provide and to protect their wife and their children spiritually. And by that I mean providing by doing prayer, suffering, and good works to merit the graces so that they can live the life they're supposed to, to be obedient and to be rightly ordered, and to protect them, that is, by making sure that nothing immoral gets into the house, and they have to be brutal about that. No pornography, no disordered types of video games, not that video games are evil, but some of them are. There there can't be any toleration of that, but he also has to make sure that he is saying prayers on a regular basis to keep his family protected spiritually. And if he does that, that will provide a tremendous amount of protection for him. For kids, the principal way that you avoid ending up getting beat around and tempted in ways that are uh, not good is by being obedient to your parents. Again, I know your parents are the dumbest people that ever lived. Don't worry about it. When you're 25, they'll somehow have gotten a lot smarter. But the fact is, is that it doesn't matter if you're obedient to them when you're younger, then what will happen is you'll stay within that authority structure and then you'll have a tremendous amount of spiritual protection. The last area I want to talk about is sacramentals. You know, the Catholic life is such a fantastic life. The Catholic Church is so rich. I get, I get such a charge out of the fact that all the intellectual Protestants are converting to Catholicism and all the ignorant Catholics are leaving the church, right? <laughs> but here's the thing. One of the rich areas of the, of the Catholic life um, is the sacramentals. Now, the sacraments, obviously the sacraments, receive, I should say that the, receiving the sacraments, getting to Mass on every day, Sunday and Holy Days of Obligation, even during the week if you can, getting to confession on a regular basis, um, you know, making sure that all your sacraments don't get married outside the church, and also make sure that um, you know, you're confirmed, you get all the confirmation, you get all, make sure all your sacraments are in order. That is going to be one of the principal ways in which you're going to be protected. It's the ordinary means of sanctification. But the sacramentals, so the sacrament is an outward sign instituted by God to give grace. These are the ones that Christ established. But then the church can establish outward signs, which also can confer grace, but in a lesser way, and they're called sacramentals. So this would include things like holy water. There are five kinds of holy water, by the way. The first is the holy water blessed in the new rite. It's true holy water, but it's blessed in the new rite, and it's just a simple blessing. Then there's the order of making holy water in the old rite. And basically, it's much more stout. You see this even in sessions during, uh, when you're dealing with people who are possessed. And the reason it's more stout is because you exercise salt, you bless the salt. You exercise the water, then you, bless, then you bless the water. You put the two together, and then you ask for a series of things in relationship to uh, the holy water, which makes it much more stout. There's a general principle. What you ask for is what you get. The way it's normally... Um, formulated in theology as prayer begets what it signifies. We see this right in scripture. Christ said, knock and it will be opened. He didn't say knock and I'll hand you a loaf of bread. He said, knock and it will be opened. Ask and you shall receive. There's a proportion between what you ask for and what you get. This is again why precision in your prayer and spiritual warfare is so key. But the, but the, the, what, there's a series of things that are actually asked for in the old right blessing which actually makes it more efficacious. Then after that, there's the epiphany water, which is also done in the old rite, but it's basically the order of making holy water on steroids because it's solemnized by chant. You chant the whole thing almost. And it takes like 25 minutes, which is why a lot of priests are lazy and don't want to do it. Okay. The, third, the fourth one is what we, they call luster water. Now, in the old rite, what happens is, is and on, the, um, on the eve of Easter... What happens is, is that there is a, there, that's when they make uh, um, baptismal water. And what happens is in the old rite is you, you start the series of blessings. So you do this series of blessings of the holy water, and then part of that is taken out, and that's what you make the uh, baptismal water out of by adding oils. The other part of the water is called lustral water, and it's even more effective than epiphany water in dealing with demons. So if you can get your hands on that, that's fantastic. 
The only other water that is more effective than that is called Gregorian water. And it's, if you, if you I, I mean, I managed to get a bottle of it, but it's, uh, and I only use it very sparingly because it's, that's like hen's teeth, you know. And so, but basically it's the water that only a bishop can make only when he's consecrating an altar. And it's the most effective that I've ever found in relationship to demons. So you've got holy water. So what do you do with holy water? Well, you can do everything from consuming it. The salt, by the way, if you get exercise salt, feed it to your teenage kids. On a regular basis, by the way. But you have, um, and in this diocese, I don't think there's any restrictions, although Father would know. You can also get exercised uh, olive oil, which you can feed your kids to. You can consume it. But the exercise salt can be also spread around the um, property, spread around your house. One of the things I often recommend is buying those salt blocks that you get at farm and ranch stores. Have the priest exercise them, put them in the, bury them in the four corners of your properties with Benedict medals and miraculous medals to create a parameter around your property. It's extraordinarily effective, especially if you're living next to some people that aren't so good. Then, um, but the salt can be used, you can use it in cooking, you just got to make sure that you're consuming all of it. The salt is very expensive, the holy water, you can sprinkle the holy water around. I rec really recommend, again, if you have teenagers, not that I like teenagers, by the way, but the father, at least, should be sprinkling holy water around his house on a regular basis, asking our Lord and our Lady to, um, to bless their house and to, to protect it. Fathers can also bless their children and their wives. They should be doing that on a regular basis. It's right out of the Old Testament. It's part of the church's tradition, even though it's completely lost on most modern Catholics. Uh, the wife can bless their children as well. The, uh, so that should be being done in the way you, do, you take just a little bit of exercise oil or exercise uh, um, holy water, and you just uh, make the sign of the cross on the person's head and make God bless you. That's it. That's all you have to do. There are also, there's also other things like um, you can bless beer and wine. You can actually, there's exorcisms even for that. There's um, blessings and exorcisms for different kinds of food. You should be blessing your food on a regular basis. I don't care if you're in public. Do it anyway. So um, there are cases of possession where we've seen people became possessed because they consumed food that had been cursed. So you want to make sure you're blessing your food, which you do it. You should have your medicines blessed because a lot of the medicines, especially the stuff that's coming from China now, um, although with the supply chain issues, probably less of that, um, a lot of that stuff coming across the border, they're actually doing rituals in China. We found that out some time ago. It's actually, you can get that information on the Internet. They're doing rituals over this stuff. So you should bless your, have your priest. There's blessings that the priest can do for, for that. All sorts of kind of food that you can bless, bread, there's different day, feast days where you can bless food and exercise it um, in relationship to all that. So that's on that side. There's also um, um, the blessing of a candle, especially in the old rite. It actually asks for Christ to drive the demons of the air away. It, it drive them. It's kind of funny, the demons of the air are an interesting thing. Basically what happens is, is when we commit sin, the demons gain more and more control over the air. And there is an actual ritual against storm and tempest. And I'll give you a couple of examples of how effective that ritual is. I used to live in Oklahoma. So at one point, there were two tornadoes barreling towards our property. And one of my spiritual director, or spiritual directees, sorry, calls me and she says, you better take coverage. And I'm like, nah. So I go back to my, my um, by because we each had our own individual um, hermitages. And I went back to my hermitage, and I just did this, uh, the ritual against storms and tempests, right? So then I turned on the news, and all of the newscasters are like, we don't know what happened. These things just disappeared, right? I've done that five times. It's worked every single time. Then I've even used it for hail, but I haven't been in most places in Colorado where that tends to happen, so I can't help you. Okay. But then another priest who is in our society, there was a tornado that was actually heading directly towards where he was um, staying at the time. He did that. The tornado literally lift up over the building he was in and, went, and continued going through. This tells you that, you know, they talk about global warming and climate change. Well, there probably is. It's just demons getting more control over the weather. But, uh, but anyway, that being said, the 
Candles will drive out demons of the air, but they also drive out demons from out from out your house. You can use also um, blessed incense for that. So burning a candle on a regular basis can be very efficacious in that. Play, uh, you've heard me say this, playing chant in the background at a very low level. You'll probably drive your kids nuts, but that's okay. okay. Then we have um, just one more, a couple more things here, and that is Benedict medals and miraculous medals or medals of different kinds. These types of sacramentals, the Benedict medal especially, is very effective uh, in keeping demons at bay, having one on your person, putting them in, a, in your house, Putting them over the tops of your entryways to your house can actually be very effective. Um, there's a whole host of things in relationship to sacramentals. You can listen. I go into a, I have a conference where I just talk just about sacramentals and their use. But there's a whole host of these things. The Catholic Church is so rich. There's so many different weapons. These are all different kinds of weapons that we can use. And a lot of times when you're dealing with spiritual warfare, it's a matter of finding the thing that seems to work the best. You see, demons, uh, every demon, not every demon is sensitive to every type of sacramental or every prayer or what have you. One of the big mistakes is you'll actually hear people say, well, if you were possessed, you couldn't receive Holy Communion to go to confession. That's false. <coughs> it's true about some people, but the fact of the matter is, is that demons have different sensibilities. They're sensitive based upon the sin that they committed. But they can also be the dynamics of the possession case. The actual same thing is true in relationship to your own particular life. Demons that might be afflicting you might be particularly sensitive to holy water, or to exercise oil, or to some, some other kind of sacramental. And you'll find that when, or some particular prayer, and you'll find whenever you say these prayers that it just, everything calms down and it's good for a while. And that tells you that that's their sensitivity in relationship to it, and you should use it. And so I tell people, you know, you should get a big repertoire, try different things. Say binding prayers in relationship to any demons affecting your children, etc. Even the particular things you're seeing in your children, like the bad behavior, the specific kinds of behavior. Father, my kid just cannot keep his hands out of the cookie jar. Well, then you bind demons of cookie jars. Okay. But the point being is, is that you, you start, but you be very specific. But the demons can also be sensitive based upon their sin, but they can also be sensitive based upon what God wants you to learn or achieve in your spiritual life. And this gives us a great deal of hope. And one of the things that we read in Scripture, and then we'll end with this and go to the Q&A, one of the things we read in Scripture is I mentioned that Christ deals with demons in 23% of the Gospels. In 23% of the Gospels, he's dealing with demons. And he, you see he's just kicking them out right and left, right? And there's no demon that's not subject to him. And this should, if we are, if we are, truly devoted to Christ and followers of Christ, and we are doing everything we can to become like Christ, and we love him, and we want to be with him for all eternity, that, and if we have perfect confidence in him, we can have confidence that he will exercise that power over them and protect us. It's a great deal of confidence, even though we, I, you know, I talked about, well, this is, the, this is how bad everything is. It's true. But Christ, if we have humility and we live a good Catholic life in all its facets, we will be protected, our families will be protected, and we can be confident that Christ will protect us from any type of diet, serious diabolic influence, and he will also protect us even when he allows them for the sake of our sanctification. We can be confident that he will give us the grace to be victorious. Okay. Any questions? Okay, we will uh, come around with microphones again, and, and just a real quick um, shameless plug, I guess you will. We actually use the blessing that Father's talking about on all of our holy water. So that tank right back there, we're going to have a run on it, I'm pretty sure, <laughs> is, uh, is done in the old rite by either Father Essio or myself, exorcising salt, blessing salt, exorcising water, blessing water, and then combining them. We also have, I think, a small supply left of the epiphany water. We can exercise and bless salt. We exercise and bless uh, St. Benedict medals and so on and so on. So if you want a good, good sacramental parish, St. Mark's for you. <laughs> so, <laughs> questions? Yeah. I was wondering if you could talk more about mental prayer. Um, obviously, you said uh, there's vocal prayer, and that's the majority of Catholics. We just don't really go into um, meditation. So I was wondering if you could talk more about 
um, the different levels of that and how um, we can better embrace that daily. And um, maybe, can you talk about maybe the how how we know we're going to the next level? Mm, yeah. Uh, well, the first thing is is that I'd really recommend. Um, first, you have to kind of know how mental work, the mechanics of it, how it works. So I usually recommend people. You can go online and actually download St. Francis de Sales um, tract on meditation. It's only about 13 to 14 pages long. Um, I'm pretty sure EWTN has it on their document library, but it's out there and read that. And that ta- that walks you through the mechanics of how you do mental prayer, etc. If you want something more extensive, there's a book called The Ways of Mental Prayer by Lahodi, L-E-H-O-D-E-Y, and it's printed by Tan. It's probably the best book. It's a little dry, but it gives you the full mechanics of how to end, how to do meditation well. So that's where I would start. And then the, the other side of it is you have to be willing to dedicate consistently 15 minutes a day as a start. If you do that, you're going to, like I said, you're going to find a big shift in the spiritual battle, but you're also going to notice a huge change in your own interior life. St. Thomas used to talk about how if you did daily meditation, certain defects you had just would evaporate. You didn't even have to work on them. Your spiritual life just became significantly easier. And so, and as I mentioned, Teresa Valley said it's the entry rate, all the other, other higher levels of prayer. If you want to know about the different levels of prayer, I do have a conference called The Nine Levels of Prayer, but you can also read a book called Spiritual Theology by Jordan Allman. In there, he talks about the nine levels of prayer and what the hallmarks of each one of those are. The one warning I would give you is that as you start getting close to the prayer of simplicity, which is the fourth level of prayer, um, God starts to strip from you your ability to see who and what you are, and you enter into a state of profound blindness. So you can't tell where you're at. It's at that point you really need to have a spiritual director who really understands the mechanics. But most people, it takes a while to get there. Okay, But those are the recommendations I would make in relationship to meditation. Over here, Father. Thank you, Father, for presenting this mission. Um, As you're speaking tonight about the sacramentals and various different kinds of oils and holy waters, many of which I'm familiar with. I'll be checking Amazon later for Gregorian water, see if I can get my hands on any of that. I doubt it's on Amazon, <laughs> although you might find it on eBay because they sell everything on eBay. <laughs> there you go. So I, I'm hearing all those things, and then I'm also thinking about a comment that you made yesterday about scrupulosity being a yeah. distraction from God, and I'm hoping you can provide... Um, maybe some further guidance uh, or for, for some further instruction on a balance perhaps that needs to be struck, if any, between the various different sacramentals, levels of efficaciousness yeah. and scrupulosity. Yeah, actually, that's a really good question. It really boils down to um, the sacramentals should be used based on the nature and what they are and what they're intended for. But they also, uh, their use should be moderated based on circumstances where people who are scrupulous sometimes, especially if they're superstitious to some degree, they'll use it in a superstitious fashion where they're just like, you know, the kid coughs and they're sprinkling him with holy water. Well, you know, he probably just needs some water, you know. And so, uh, regular water. So the point being is, is that they should be used in a way that's more moderated and, and based upon what could authentically be there, um, based upon the intention of the church for that particular sacramental. The scrupulosity, there's actually two types of scrupulosity. The first is is where the person does not have clarity about the past sins that they've confessed, and they try and gain the clarity, which they're not going to get, so I tell them, stop it. Just you keep your focus on God. But then the other part of it is, um, uh, and there is one principle which I think will help to get that balance, but the other type of scrupulosity is where the person is trying to figure out whether the sin that they're committing or whatever the case may be or what they're thinking about or what have you is actually grave matter or not. They're not sure of the degree of the sin. And so I tell them, again, you're not going to get clarity in that particular case. You've got to get your mind off of it because you're, you only get clarity after you get out from underneath the diabolic influence or out from underneath. In this particular case, it can also be psychological. So you have to be able to get out from underneath that. And the thing, the primary... Uh, the primary, and I just lost my thought about the principle that governs sacramental use. Uh, the thing that moderates it, uh, the use of the sacramentals, is that the person's focus is on God and not themselves. What happens is when people start having an immoderated use of the sacramentals or using them the way they're not supposed to or using them for everything when they should be you know, just using them on the things that actually should be used on or need to be used on, 
It's because of the fact that the person themselves believes that it's up to them or that they can drive all the demons out by doing all this. So they, they assume the burden of dealing with all the demons and driving them out when that's not your job. Your job is to be the instrument of Christ, and so you just use it when that's, it should be used and not when it's to be used, and don't think that you're going to be the one that's going to drive them, drive them out, because you're not. So if you keep your focus on God and only deal with things when you see them, that will help to moderate it. Father, thanks for uh, all your services at Christ Church. Um, I have a question or clarification from last night. You made a comment that all, I think I, you said all demons are Catholic. Yeah. So, so I started to think, well, roughly 20% of the world is Catholic. Right. So the demons attack the other 80%? <laughs> they do. <laughs> Nobody's immune. Do, my, do, my, are, my, you called, I say are you called to... To uh, non-Catholics' homes, on occasion, yes. Okay, um, and uh, sometimes we'll will be asked. Uh, you know, when I said that they're all Catholics, that's their their understanding is Catholic. It doesn't mean that they don't tempt everybody else. Um, but yeah, we do actually get Catholics that come to us. There's two conditions which uh, are now in place in regard to like for doing exorcisms over non-Catholics. Um, historically, the one requirement from the uh, propagation of the faith, which was done in 1797, was that they had to make sure that in doing the exorcisms that the people understood that the power came from Jesus Christ and not from the priest. So that was the only condition. But uh, in the new rite of exorcism, they've actually added another condition, which I think does bind even outside using the new rite. I think it binds always. And that is, is that um, in order to do it, that you have to have permission of the local ordinary, that is your local bishop. And I think they're just trying to Make sure that some priest isn't, you know, going all over the place, exercising, you know, everybody along the way, and so that it's done in accord with the mind of the church. So, and I have had people, ironically, sometimes the Protestants liberate faster than the Catholics because they're sometimes more virtuous than the Catholics. All right. Okay, uh, Father, quick question. Assuming that um, uh, all the angels fell from the nine choirs in heaven, yeah. and assuming that Lucifer was a seraphim angel, and assuming that Michael was an archangel, how could an archangel have enough knowledge to stop the rebellion against much higher ranked angels? Why couldn't there be another seraphim angel that was wise enough to stop the rebellion? Why was it Michael? And if since Michael obeyed, does that mean that he's still an archangel or did his position ride in the ranks in heaven? Yeah, that's a good question. First of all, let me thank you because that was one of my, I, I, by the way, I have to apologize. There were so many loose ends I left on this con these conferences. I'd start a thought, I was on to something else. Okay. You have to come Stream back. of consciousness with Father Chad Ripper. Okay. <laughs> but that was one of them I was going to address. And actually what it basically boils down to is, remember, I don't know if you were here, but I talked about what's called prelation, which is basically the power that God grants to, the, to different um, things and by different degrees. And so what happens is, as soon as Satan committed the sin, or Lucifer committed his sin, he lost his prelation in relationship to heaven. So he lost his power that is derived from his state of grace and from his position in heaven. As a result of that, St. Michael then was given, it, says, it even says, it says, St. Um, Michael, by the power of God. So Saint, he did, he, God gave St. Michael the power to separate uh, the angels and the demons, and, and then as a result, there's now this abyss, which they've talked about in Scripture, between. And so that's where the humiliation comes, is that this guy who's much lower in the order of nature blew them all out. And so, and that tells you how powerful St. Michael is. Um, can anyone here tell me who or what St. Michael is the guardian angel of? What's that? No, well, no. Technically speaking, he's the guardian angel of the Catholic Church. Interesting, huh? of the elect. And that's fascinating. He used to be, it was interesting, according to the fathers of the church, he was the guardian angel of the Jews. And as soon as Christ established Catholicism, his guardian angelship shifted to the Catholic Church, which I found interesting. Okay, so uh, can they raise their place in heaven? No. And the reason being is, is they're very different from us. So what happens in relationship to us is that um, because we 
in this life, we're, we're in what we call the wayfaring state, which basically means that we're in this process of working out our salvation, as St. Paul says, but by performing prayer, suffering, and good works in the state of grace, you have to be in the state of grace, um, with a supernatural intention, you can raise your place in heaven. And so as a result, it's possible, like Our Lady's above all the angels and saints and some of the other angels, uh, say it's clear that St. Joseph and um, St. Um, uh, John the Baptist is above um, all the, the uh, uh, is above all the other angels as well. So they're, cause they're because of the way that they're talked about, at least in Scripture and also in relationship to how the tradition has always addressed them. And so they, we can actually move our way up, right, and get, so we can actually be above certain angels and below certain angels, etc., in the hierarchy of grace in heaven. And that, whoever, where you're at, determines how much authority that you have in heaven. But in heaven, the authority works a little bit different, obviously, than it does in relation with demons, because with demons, the only thing left is power. So in hell, they actually have a pecking order, but it's based upon <clears throat> how strong of a will they have. Satan has the, because where you're at in the hierarchy of angels, and though it's based purely on the order of nature. So the higher the essence or the nature of the thing, the more powerful is its intellect, and therefore the more proportionate is powerful is his will. So that meant when Satan fell, even though his will is on the natural order, the most powerful of all created wills, it still isn't strong enough to overcome even the lowest of the saints in heaven's prelation. And so, um, but the angels, um, their amount of sanctifying grace is proportionate to their nature. So when God created them, he created them in this state of grace, and they only had one choice. And that choice then merited their being in heaven. It didn't raise their place in heaven. From that point on, they can't go up and down in the hierarchy. But human beings can. Okay. Um, thank you for answering our questions. And. Uh, one question that just came to me is um, when we read scripture, there's a passage that talks about uh, the demon getting out of a house and then he sees that it's all clean and so he goes and asks for more friends to come back. Um, when is it possible that this can happen so it's better not to have an exorcism for that same reason? Um, okay. What happens is, is that, uh, and we see this from time to time as exorcists. So what happens is, is someone will come to us, we'll do the prayers, um, and I'll give you an, I'll just, I'll use a concrete example. This, this, these parents brought this girl to me who they said they thought was possessed, and um, sure enough, she was. She was uh, 15 at the time. We did the exorcisms. It only took a week, and she was liberated. So I sat her down. And I said, Hey, look, this is how this has to work you had better get your life in order and you better stop doing these particular things because these are open doors to diabolic influence. And if you don't stop this, you're going to end up in a worse state. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She's looking at her phone, right? Four months later, the parents bring her back and now she's possessed, literally, she had one demon, she's literally possessed by seven of which Lucifer is one of them. And I said, you, uh, so I started just asking her some questions. I said, I won't, I won't do the exorcisms for you because you're not, you're not serious about overcoming this. So, but if one of the other priests in the society wants to do it, I'll let him do it. And so one of the priests said, yeah, he would do it. Same thing. A week later, she's completely cleaned up. He sits her down, says, you've got to stop doing these things. and gives her the same talk I did. Yeah, 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 looking at her phone. A year later, her parents brought her back to me, and by this time, we knew at least three of the possessors. Underneath Satan, there are what they call the council, or the table, or the generals, depending on how they like to refer to themselves as. These are the five demons that are under Satan and execute his commands. They're the most powerful demons other than Satan. The first one is Baal. He's a demon of impurity. Then, once Baal makes headway into a particular society or into a particular person's life, then what happens is, is that the, uh, the right order in relationships to the conjugal act gets lost, and then St. Paul describes it. Men start sleeping with men and women with women. So then the next three are uh, Asmodeus, who's the demon of impurity, or the demon of homosexuality in men, Lilith, 
who is the demon of homosexuality in women of the passive kind, or Leviathan, which is the demon of homosexuality in women of the aggressive kind. The next one after that is, and this is what you see in, in, in almost every single culture that it's ever happened. This is how you see every single culture historically was taken out. The last one is uh, Balfamet, who's the demon of child sacrifice. Abortion. Okay. They shot down the fornication laws in our country in the, in the 60s and 70s. Then they allowed abortion, which took a little bit of a different route than it normally does. So Balfamet. So they, they basically, the first thing they did is deliver our, the court system delivered our country into the hands of Baal. Then with abortion, they delivered it into the hands of Balfamet. Then with gay marriage, they delivered it into the hands of all three of the um, demons of homosexuality. Right now, thanks to our court system, our, hand, our country is under the control of the five generals of Satan. That's how that works. That's why abortion is so stubborn to get out. That's why any, any discussion of a purity is just completely out the door. This is why the homosexual lobby has so much power, etc. Okay. She was possessed by three of those guys. And I told her, these are beefy dudes. And by the way, you're 19 now. You're an adult. You're going to be treated like an adult. You are going to go six months without committing mortal sin going to confession once every two weeks, and you're going to go to Mass every Sunday and Holy Day of Obligation before I will even consider working with you again. She was just shocked. She thought she was going to get her car wash again. To my knowledge, she's still possessed. And each successive time when she became possessed, she did something dumber and dumber, right? So the point being is, is that they can get back in. So in cases where you, there are cases once in a while, you realize if I liberate this person, they're going to end up in a bad or worse situation. You just have to kind of first get them to do certain things first and get on their feet on certain areas of their spiritual life. But most people, uh, in my experience, I haven't had too many recidivists. And the, my recidivists are the people who fall back. And the reason being is, is because when... People start the exorcisms, normally they kind of drag out a little bit, and they get beat around, and it's brutal, and so they get toughened up. So by the time they get done, they're just like, okay, I'm not going back to that uh, bad situation again. Okay. Yes. Yeah, so we got a question just around, like, family life. Uh, we've got a young family, like, two-year-old going through terrible twos. Obviously, she's not possessed or anything, but <laughs> at what age do you, like, really recognize where kids will be influenced greater by... Um, just demonic activity? Is it that age of reason? Is it when they're younger, still, like, obviously praying for them, but ha have that more precise precision prayer around spiritual warfare for younger kids, or what age? Yeah, I mean, I think it's, there. Uh, I mean, the primary thing, of course, is to get your child baptized, and then, of course, making sure that, um, you know, that, that they're being properly taken care of. And you say prayers for their protection up until the age of reason. It's at the point where they can start committing sin that you really want to kind of ramp up the prayers a little bit. Um, obviously, from the time of the age of reason until before they go through puberty, God adjusts people's temptations as a general rule based upon their condition and state. So I mentioned that relationship to people who are autistic. And so once they go through puberty, though, it's, um, it's that that becomes a crucial stage. One of the other things that you're going to do to prepare kids for the spiritual warfare is between the time of birth and actually the, t uh, the age of reason, children don't have use of reason. They only understand association and disassociation. So you can associate good behavior with being rewarded and bad behavior with, not, with, uh, with punishment. And uh, Aristotle basically says, look, the only thing kids understand at a certain age is pleasure and pain, right? That's the only thing. That, and yeah, that's why you have to make these associations. The Jesuits used to say, give me your child until they're the age of 12, and I'll talk about why that is, and, and then you can have them for the rest of your life. But it's in that stage that you start building the associations in the child's mind between this is good behavior and this is bad behavior. The people who say, well, I can never spank my child, well, I'm sorry, but Dr. Spock does not trump God. God said in the Old Testament, spare the rod, hate your child. And so the facts of the matter, and I'm, by the way, I'm not suggesting you go around beating your kids, okay? So, but the point being is, is that, the, that the proportion of proper spanking, et cetera, there has to be discipline. I cannot tell you how many people bring their kids to me that are 10 years old. It's always a boy, and he's just out of control. I might have mentioned this. He's just out of control. And they're like, we think he's possessed. So I just ask him, when was the last time you spanked him? Oh, no, we don't do that. Start spanking him. See how that works out for you. 
Okay. Uh, Father, thank you for... Hold on, I just want to finish this one last thought. So once they get through the... So that there's a... You're building up a, a set of associations. Then from the time in which they have use of reason until the time in which they have, go through puberty, that's the initial stages in which virtue can actually be built, where the child is making their own choices to do the right things, but it has to be built upon this foundation. This is one of the reasons why I keep telling everybody, don't be sending your kids to daycares unless they're of a very specific kind, because that, it's at that early stage that these, all these associations upon which the building of virtue is layered. Then after that... Once they go through puberty, if they've already been developing virtue, then it's after puberty that they can perfect the virtues. Before then, they can't have perfect virtue, but after that, they can perfect the virtues. And that will begin, if you, as you build a child up in virtue, teaching him what the virtues are. There's 64 virtues. I bet you most people can't name them. There's 64 virtues. Teaching the children what your virtues are, teaching them how to do that, living them yourselves. Then what will happen is by the time they get to 18, they're going to be pretty much immune to most diabolic influence. Okay. Father, thank you for being here, and uh, thank you for being a warrior for Christ. You spoke the other night about us living under a form of soft communism, and I was just wondering if you could share your thoughts about the consecration that was done recently and the uh, impact of communism in the world now. Um, my take on the consecration actually has to do with an apparition that happened with Sister Lucia later after the original request to consecrate Russia to her Immaculate Heart. She later said to Saint, um, or to Lucia, uh, Lucia, she said, in the end the Pope will do it, but it will be too late to avert the events, of the, uh, basically the events to which it was originally Tended to avert. Originally, then think of this: all God wanted was a five-minute prayer from one man, and all of the entire deep state and communistic thing would have been completely subverted. That's all he wanted, and we wouldn't be going through any of this nonsense that we're going through now. None of it, but. Our Lady predicted, she said, in the, she said, the Holy Father will do it, so I think that the, the, the consecration did take place. In the end, the Holy Father will do it, but it won't avert the events. And she already said at Akita, Japan, the chastise coming, it's too late. There's nothing you can do ex except pray you're spared the effects of it. But I said, oh, that's pretty good news. We can actually pray that we're spared the effects of it. She should be praying for you and your family to be spared the effects of it. The point being is, is that, uh, and there's all sorts of prophecies about what this chastisement is going to look like. I won't go into those because that's a whole conference of itself. But I do think that, that, that 